Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, the 4th of November 2015, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish. With me in the studio, Mike Robinson. And um, the weather. Well, the weather not looking too good. We've got some very interesting reports. Norfolk, particularly gloomy. Plymouth, pretty gloomy. London, particularly dingy and gloomy, uh, with a bit of rain, of course. Um, what else have we got here? Holland, no weather at all, being postponed. Presumably that's climate change. But it's always raining in Holland. It's always raining in Holland. That's why they have those dikes. Well, uh, where do we begin? We better begin with a dark subject, which has got to be Theresa May, I would have thought, Mike. Uh, yes, but um, contrary to being gloomy, she, she was crowing just a few minutes ago about uh, her new her new bill, which is going to be presented to Parliament in the spring, apparently. But she's given this heads up to everybody um, now for some reason. Not sure why that is. Uh, but anyway, she's gone and done it. Snoopers Charter on its way. Uh, and uh, as I say, she gave a statement just finished, but just before we came online, uh, because apparently a digital society brings us challenges. Um, and she said that in 12 months, there have been six significant terrorist plots, loads of cyber attacks, 50,000 people apparently downloading child pornography. She didn't mention how many of those were uh, in or associated with the Houses of Parliament, but uh, quite a number, I would have thought. Um, and so she's bringing about a new bill, which is going to be a license to operate for the uh, for GCHQ and so on. Um, but she claims that it's not going to deny people the right to encryption. Uh, but of course, it's got to be the right kind of encryption, uh, because the last thing you want is to give anybody a safe space online. Uh, and so if you're using encryption, which uh, which GCHQ can't deal with, that would be a very bad thing. That would be unfair. It really. would be unfair. Um, yeah. And uh, and she also said um, that uh, it's quite all right that GCHQ is going to be um, spying on MPs, private uh, communications with their constituents, possibly with whistleblowers, whatever that might be. That's quite all right, because um, the Prime Minister would be informed if that if there was such a requirement. Well, I, I think that's um, I think that's reasonable. If you're running a dictatorship, you obviously want the uh, head of state of the dictatorship to be fully in control. Um, what else can I say, really? Uh, well, not very much. Now, on Radio 4 this morning, I just wanted to highlight this, because uh, Sarah Thornton, uh, of course, as we know, our favourite chief police officer, uh, head of the uh, National Police Chiefs Council, she told the Radio 4 Today programme, um, that uh, the police do want this, the surveillance laws to be updated. Law enforcement needs access to communications data to protect the public and to investigate crime. So that's good. Now, uh, one of the other things that Theresa May mentioned, of course, was this business of uh, internet service providers being required um, to maintain browsing records. So in other words, uh, people, internet service providers would be maintaining lists and holding those lists for a year of your browsing history. Uh, it's quite all right, though, because what they're not going to be doing is actually looking at what you're doing. They're only going to be recording um, which websites you visited. And that is pretty much like having an itemized bill on your telephone, apparently. Yeah, it's that simple. Um, this thing was outrageous, Mike, actually. I wasn't able to hear it all as she was talking through. But one of the things she said is that there's going to be uh, another layer of oversight, independent oversight, of course, of the whole Reaper process, uh, which is going to be independent because a judge is running it. So all the other levels she listed, she said, well, judges are looking at those independent new level, another judge. Um, could the UK column ask for some help today? And that is that uh, we have tried over a a number of months to get detailed information as to how judges are appointed. There is, of course, a, ju a judicial appointments um, commission. However, when you ask how the people who select the judges are appointed, uh, that commission doesn't actually want to speak or provide any information. But, but it, is, uh, but it is transparent. Well, according to Brian Levison, because he said in a speech a couple of weeks ago that, that judicial appointments are now totally transparent. Right. Well, if we can ask for any help from our uh, viewers and listeners, can you get off those emails, freedom of information requests, perhaps, uh, to get some information so that we can actually see clearly and transparently how these independent judges will be appointed in order to run all of this security. And um, I, I just think that if you look at the nest, the web that this woman has created of surveillance, 
Don't forget, we've still got all the MAPRA arrangements in place. We've got all of the security coming in around children. We think that they're going to try and push for the named person scheme south of the border. Theresa May is the spider at the centre of a spying ring, which I don't think any country has ever seen it on this scale before, Mike. Not, not on this scale. Now, of course, uh, according to Francis Fraud, um, this is the most transparent country in the world. And, of course, the relationship between the state and the individual in its changing form, uh, the individual ex life is expected to be absolutely transparent yeah. to the state. Uh, but um, over the last number of weeks, this discussion of freedom of information requests um, and, uh, and the uh, consultation that's going on over FO FOI at the moment, it's absolutely clear that what the government does not want to be is transparent to the individual. Um, so Chris Grilling absolutely coming out against journalists' use of freedom of information, uh, calling it unacceptable. As I say, there is a continuing um, uh, review of freedom of information going on at the moment. And one of the things that they were, uh, that the Independent was pointing out a couple of weeks ago is that uh, people may have to pay £100 to make uh, a freedom of information request under uh, this new review. So this is quite um, similar in many respects to the way that um, the access to the courts has been removed from uh, most people through the massive increases in court costs that are going on. This seems to be their solution to everything. You may, you cut cut back on, on people's incomes and in the meantime you put a, a financial barrier to to getting access to justice, or in this case, to freedom of, of information. And we, we should remember, of course, that uh, Tony Blair, when he was interviewed a little while ago about things he may have regretted when he was in power, specifically said the Freedom of Information Act. And Jack Straw as well, of course, because mm. he, he was the man that brought it in, uh, absolutely regrets it as well. But what I would say to Chris Grilling now um, is, surely, Mr Grilling, if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear. That's what we're told. Um, so um, I don't quite understand this uh, this move to shut down freedom of information. It must just be. Uh, I mean, what's what's? Could, could we put a positive line in there? We understand the shutdown of information. The shutdown is coming because the government knows and understands that the wider public is now looking in the right direction. People are making educated, calculated. Um, Analyses. Analyses of what's going on. They're asking for the information. And of course, the government doesn't want to give that information because that is the baseline evidence that what the public suspects is going on. So if you're somebody watching us or listening to UK Column and you want the good news, the good news is that the government is introducing these measures because they are terrified of the exposure that the Freedom of Information Act gives. So what does that say? Before that £100 come in, get out there and get those requests in. But also, if £100 comes in, people need to work together as groups, uh, 100 people in your group, and it's still viable. So this is fear, in my opinion, Mike, of, uh, from the British government. Absolutely. Um, now, in United, uh, on the same kind of subject in New Zealand, it's quite interesting because New Zealand is one of the uh, so-called five eyes. Uh, the spying alliance, as it's known, um, they are bringing in um, legislation to protect people who make disclosures. This is following the uh, Edward Snowden thing, of course. Uh, you could be cynical about this and you could say, well, what are they actually doing? They're trying to uh, encourage people to come forward so they can actually um, work out who knows what and who's prepared to speak out. Uh, but it can't be seen as a bad thing, I don't think, overall, can it? I don't think so, because uh, any move in the right direction should be reinforced by the public. That's the key That the key is part. the key part, yes. Yes. Uh, what, well, from uh, what we've already covered in the news today, it looks as though we're heading into a completely new world. So let's just have a look at this image. What is all this about? It's not a Star Wars film. Uh, this is the start of private policing by stealth. Um, this is not a joke. It's not amusing. The Telegraph here, security guards to form private police force in city centre. Um, guards have been accused of trying to form a private police force in a major city centre. Now, what are they talking about? They're talking about Securitas. Um, just have a look at this company's website. It's boasting of 320,000 employees uh, right the way across the world. We'll have a look at that in a minute. 
This is this is a private army, uh, totally unaccountable to the British public, and now starting to move in on policing. Um, the, the website is interesting. There's there's a video which you might like to go and have a, a look. I was just fascinated. It homes in on their Milton Keynes um, high tech building. Here it is. It's called Cobra House. We'll come back onto that. But this is a little overview from their site of all the countries worldwide where they're providing security uh, in all areas, nuclear security, military security. And of course, they are boasting about their ability to set up huge new control centers uh, where they're able to bring in everything, audio, spying, CCTV. Well, it's not closed because it's now being linked citywide. And this is the key thing for me. Go and have a look at the members of the board. These people are not British. Their allegiance is not to the UK. Their allegiance is not to people in the communities in this country. Their allegiance is to the money makers who run the company in the first place. And if you have a look at their share allocations, uh, you, you can easily see what's going on. So our police are being pushed out of their jobs by this vicious uh, conservative, I'm going to call it dictatorship. We might mention that in a minute. And power is simply being given into the hands of foreign businessmen. And ultimately, of course, who runs these companies? The banks, I would say. But here's the little interesting bit. Just fascinating um, coincidence that Securitas uh, is running from Cobra House, which is the same as the government's own Cobra meeting room for security. Yes, maybe they view themselves as some kind of snake. Uh, possibly. Uh, well, if we put a bit of meat on that report there from the Telegraph, uh, up to 100 officers could be employed by Securitas to patrol the streets of Manchester following, following a pioneering deal with local businesses. Now, that statement's very really critical. It's not talking about the local council. It's talking about local businesses. But concerns here from Mr Ian Hansen, chairman of the Greater Manchester Police Federation. Um, what does he say? This is creeping privatisation and the public need to wake up before it's too late. The public and the retailers are being forced into this. So this man seems to be absolutely on the button, Mike. And this is UK column language, isn't it? Wake up. The public needs to wake up before it's too late. And he's absolutely right that, that retailers are being forced into this because the police are being withdrawn from city centres. A prime example here in, here in Plymouth, uh, which we'll just bring up on screen. We've talked about this before. This is the Plymouth Herald report that uh, the city centres to be policed by private security officers in a bid to cut crime. And this was the company. Um, more work to be done on Axion Security Limited. Uh, they're calling themselves rangers, but these are private security people now saying they've got the power to, dete uh, to detain people in the city centre area. At the same time, Devon and Cornwall Police have lost a thousand officers since 2010 and will lose another 500 under 54 million pound cuts. Um, and then people are beginning to say here what the problems are, that the companies are motivated by profit, are less transparent and less accountable. But of course, the local paper says that um, this is inevitable. Well, that's the big lie. It's anything but inevitable. It's only inevitable if people simply refuse to condone it. So interesting that Axion, and we're going to see a little bit more on them in a minute, um, not actually directly connected with the local council, which many people think these private security companies are coming in on the back of the local council. So that's not the case. Uh, well, just before we move on, I just wanted to, to note the way this person looks, um, because of course he looks like a modern day police officer. Yes. Uh, he doesn't have the hat, but um, if you were to suggest, if I was to suggest that um, the policy to privatise the police had been a policy that was had been standing for quite a number of years, and that the, um, shall we say, relatively scruffy appearance of the modern police officer compared to say 20 years ago, um, the, the, the change in the uniform to bring them to the point where they are today, um, is that indi indicative of a policy of privatisation where, where they bring us to the point where, where you can't tell the difference between uh, a public 
serving police officer and the private security well, worker? Well, personally, Mike, I do believe that uh, the powers that are bringing in these changes are meticulous in the way they plan it out and they use public psychology. Interesting that that uh, security man's got the white shirt which police used to wear, giving them, okay, they've got a uniform, but they're not the private security man is not in the all black uniform that we've got the police in. So police now appearing increasingly thuggish in their paramilitary uniform. You ease in the private security with a rather pleasant looking uniform. Mm. Nudging, I think it's called. Um, but in the meantime, uh, G4S also, uh, was this company not banned from taking government contracts recently through some form of corruption? Something to well, do with with making bogus claims on, on uh, tags and, and tagging dead people or something? That, well, that yeah, but of course that's not really fraud if it's a big company doing it. It's only if an individual does it that it's regarded as sort of fraud and criminal activity. If you're a big company, you do it and say you're sorry, and then you just get the next gov government contract. So this is Leicestershire, Nottinghamshire and Northamptonshire police forces who have asked G4S to carry out a feasibility study, according to the BBC, to see what it might be able to offer. So they're actually touting for business from G4S. Um, come, come and operate our 999 call centre because we think you're the best placed organisation to do that uh, and our money would be well spent. Yep. Brilliant. Uh, let's bring in the irony of this one. And uh, we've shown this several times before, an independent report from back in 2014. Britain could drift towards a police state, says one of Britain's top police officers. Now, you could say there's a certain irony in this one. But of course, what the man is warning about is absolutely true. What is the police state? Well, the police state is when there is no democracy and control, generally a br brutal control, is coming from the state itself. So the police, as protectors of the public, are being pushed out now quite viciously. And in comes the uh, private police funded by the banks. So if we come back onto that Plymouth example, um, this is uh, Plymouth City Council website, becoming rather childish, I think, Mike. It's uh, full of nice little adverts, and we've got bonfire night here, and it, it all looks sort of bright and colourful, like a four-year-old's done it with crayons. But Plymouth City Council set up Plymouth Against Retail Crime Limited. Here's the private company, that's Park. Remember, private, unaccountable to the public, and it's that unaccountable company which has then taken on Axion, Axion Security Limited who call themselves Park Rangers. Nice little bit of NLP and nudging there. They're not really security, they're Park Rangers, but they're also private, unaccountable. And then in the wings, what's happening? Well, massive cuts to the police. I've just taken a Google shot there showing, of course, these cuts right the way across the country and include frontline serving police officers and PCSOs. But those are all going to be sacked. And that, of course, means that it's much easier and more lucrative for the likes of Axiom Security to get more, um, more contracts. Mm. Uh, well, the Daily Mirror back in 2014 was warning of these cuts, police cuts, Tories to axe another 34,000 cops and police staff and Mirror back on it in November 2015, we're talking about another 22,000 cuts. But these cuts don't happen by accident. Of course, it is people that uh, produce these policies and George Osborne, David Cameron, lying and lying and lying over so-called austerity, uh, which is fraud at the end of the day, banking fraud, money created from nothing. And now they're saying, well, we haven't got any money, so we've got to cut the police. And um, we could end up in the situation, Mike, where when we get a major rally, uh, that's, going to be, that's going to be monitored by private security people. Imagine that thousands of private security on the streets of London. Well, it could get to that point. In the meantime, though, um, they are appear <laughs> appearing to be slightly worried about the so-called Million Mar Mask March, which is taking place tomorrow night in London. Uh, and they're worried that th it will be a repeat of the unrest that occurred, uh, according to the Guardian here, at last year's uh, demonstration, when scuffles broke out between riot police and protesters, many wearing Guy Fawkes masks. So... Um, 
This again has to be seen as a, a reaction, a fearful reaction by the establishment, um, but also one which is uh, probably designed to create that unrest in the first place. Could, could we just uh, comment here, Mike, that of course when we saw the uh, protests in London on behalf of Royal Marine Sergeant Blackman, impeccable behaviour by the crowds, no masks, people there well dressed or dressed in uniforms, behaving well, treating the police well, being polite. And this, this gave the state no power to foment trouble. Uh, what I personally dislike with the masks is that this is the public hiding. We shouldn't be hiding because we've got nothing to hide. So marches where there's a fraction that allows the state to uh, agitate violence, of course, um, we suffer as a result of that. Potentially that's right, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, what else is uh, being cut at the moment? Uh, according to the Daily Mail, uh, the army is unable to get enough uh, recruits. It's having to offer £4,000 bonuses to get people to join the military's clerks be uh, because they haven't got enough. So this has led to huge pay problems throughout the army. And altogether, we're seeing the army in chaos. Um, now, what's remarkable about that is that... Um, uh, back in 2013, Dave, David Cameron solved all these problems by appointing this company, Capita, to actually run um, military recruiting. So the military no longer capable of recruiting for themselves. They've done that for many years. Um, what do we do? Well, we introduce a £440 million recruiting deal with another of these big security companies. Um, and what do we get? Utter chaos. Yeah. Don't have to make it up. Interestingly, a number of people are suggesting, and I don't know whether there's any truth in this or not, but they're suggesting that the ultimate ownership of Capita somehow interfaces with the Camerons, as in David Cameron's family. But uh, have... I couldn't possibly believe that. No. Well, mm. if there's anybody out there that knows a little bit about that and how these mysterious trusts work that seem to be linked to Capita, uh, we'd be very interested to know. But at the moment, of course, that's simply an allegation. Uh, so let's have a look at those men. Let's remember that these are the two principal men destroying the, the country. We shouldn't forget Oliver Letwin uh, and uh, Francis more tucked away in the cabinet office. So chaos in the military, lies chaos and breakdown. Uh, but of course, it was the UK column that uh, was warning um, back in, I think this is 2012, about uh, Cameron boasting that uh, he's done Libya, where shall he invade next? And of course, Syria was already on the cards. But at the same time, it was Cameron that was pushing for a massive uh, reduction in Britain's armed forces to the extent that they would no longer have the capacity to deal with major trouble in Europe. And that's where he's taken the country. So um, it's been on the cards for some time. Things don't happen by accident. Who is to blame? David Cameron is to blame. George Osborne is to blame. Oliver Letwin is to blame. Real people within the Conservative government. And uh, if you want a, a more interesting reflection on David Cameron, thank you very much for the people who pointed this out. This is a very unpleasant video clip of um, Israeli forces shooting uh, a wounded Palestine, um, I'll say demonstrator, uh, but a young man, he was already wounded, he was already writhing on the ground in agony. And if you watch this video clip, you can see the Israeli security uh, patrolman coming over and shooting him. Um, now, why we're interested in this is, of course, if we remember that uh, Sergeant Alexander Blackman shot an enemy on the battlefield, uh, what actually happened was he was put in prison. But of course, David Cameron has pledged his unbreakable support for Israel. And the incident of uh, this present shooting, of course, is one of similar incidents over many, many years. So, um, the British Prime Minister is a hypocrite because uh, he's fully supporting this behaviour by Israel, but one of the country's own servicemen shoots his enemy on the battlefield. Then David Cameron puts this man in prison. And we'll just remind people, of course, that David Cameron has been proud to boast that he's happy to have been using 
uh, Israel to offer advice uh, to the British government on security. Uh, this is part of a speech that he gave. We've got to stop thinking of foreign defence and security policy as separate issues. This is what Theresa May has been doing this morning. Mike mm. is beginning to link all of these things together. And um, uh, he's boasting that that's why he appointed Pauline Neville Jones to his shadow cabinet. And uh, in the coming weeks, she'll be visiting Israel to learn firsthand how it tackles terrorism. Well, it shoots them in the back is the way you do it. Um, so well done, David Cameron. And there he is talking about we need a new Bill of Rights, which presumably is going to help Theresa May install the British dictatorship. Mm. And uh, of course, it was the UK column that pointed out the considerable links between contracts that were being given uh, by Francis Maud to Israeli companies, linking them through to the very GCHQ that Theresa May is now backing for increased spying powers. But presumably that's all coincidental, I would, I would imagine. Um, and uh, that probably leads us nicely into Syria. Uh, so Vox Political here with an interesting slant because it says as the result of um, angst inside Westminster at the moment, David Cameron's apparently got a bit squidgy about Syria, so he was going to have a debate in the chamber about um, putting in more military force. That's a bit of an oxymoron because we don't really have any, but he wanted to put more military into Syria. Uh, but apparently he's dropped plans to extend airstrikes. That's what's been claimed today. Although, of course, a Downing Street source, an anonymous source, told the Mirror it was nonsense to say the plans have been dropped. But it does seem as though um, Cameron has got a little bit squidgy since the Russians have been in there. Well, there's that. I think he's absolutely scared that he's going to lose um, if he brings it into Parliament. So, um, so yes, I think uh, he's not a happy bunny on that, on that score. At the moment. He was asked about it during Prime Minister's questions. Um, his answer wasn't worth repeating, so I'm not going to. OK, George Osborne was in Germany yesterday. Um, and uh, he was giving a speech um, all about uh, uh, the European Union and, and Britain's relationship with it. Um, and uh, so there you go. There's what he began his speech by saying, uh, that uh, our military presence in Syria is greater than any other, than any other European nation. Um, but th I think this is what he was thinking. It's called ISIS. So anyway, he was giving a speech in Berlin on trade within the European Union. Uh, to look and how Britain's uh, renegotiation is going to go with regard to an in-out referendum. But uh, as a number of people have commented, uh, if you watch the speech, you get the feeling that Osborne wants to stay within the EU and not out, as he likes to claim. Well, uh, we would say that's absolutely always been the case. Um, now, the Telegraph here today was, uh, has got an article from Peter Foster who's arguing that Britain is taking a step back from the global stage, uh, but in fact it's quite the opposite. Foster says, uh, a little over five years ago, shortly after David Cameron became Prime Minister, his then Foreign Secretary William Hague gave a much trailed speech setting out a modernised vision for, the, for UK foreign policy in a, quotes, networked world. Five years on, Britain finds itself marginalised in Europe, absent in Syria, Libya and Ukraine, and increasingly estranged in Washington as George Osborne turned what should have been a carefully calibrated courtship of Beijing into the diplomatic equivalent of a teenage lunge. Well, of course, this isn't the case at all. The, ter the, the, the term that Vanessa Bailey used on uh, yesterday's news programme was soft power, and this has always been one aspect, a fairly major aspect of British foreign policy. We wrote the book on it. Um, and a couple of books by, by uh, Frank Kitson on exactly this subject. Britain is skilled at persuading people that it isn't really interested, all the while manipulating situations either from within or from behind the scenes. So Osborne's speech in Berlin seemed to recognise, for example, that the euro project, the euro as a currency, had failed, at least in part. And he argues that uh, Europe should not discriminate against those that are outside the euro. Europe, Euro, EU members, that is. Um, so it might seem uh, that he's arguing against, but in fact what he's doing is recognising uh, the economic, the current economic reality, that there can be no further Euro, Euro integration at this time, and therefore the EU should be careful about uh, not putting off prospective members in the meantime. 
But the bottom line and the biggest lie is, uh, yes, indeed, his hand gesture <laughs> is typical. Is it a real Tony Blairism there? But the bottom line is, uh, and as I say, the biggest lie is a statement that ever closer, ever closer union is not right for us any longer. And what he meant by that is that ever closer union is not right for us at the moment. Uh, Cameron and Osborne are absolutely driving for, for ever closer union on the mainland of Europe, at least. Uh, a foreign office, a treasury, EU police and EU military, just to name a few of the new institutions. So Britain will sit on the sidelines, manipulating the situation from the shadow as shadows as always. And are we just allowed to say, Mike, of course, we're also beginning to see some interesting information about the legal status of the city regions um, within a, an encompassing EU super state. So, yeah. so while these politicians are suggesting that they've got some reservations in Europe under the surface, we're seeing that that EU um, system being brought in with, with all of the legal aspects already in place. And this, of course, is part and parcel of the devolution uh, constitutional reform agenda in this country. So it seems like um, they're, they're giving rhetoric, which implies that we don't want closer union with the EU. It's quite the opposite is actually what's going on. Yeah. Um, just uh, one economic story today. Um, this is uh, UBS really telling us what we already know, that uh, Britain's, or, well, specifically London, uh, is the worst sit place in the entire planet for uh, overvaluation of property. Uh, and uh, so they are warning that this is a bubble which could burst. And, uh, you know, I re refer to the usual statement that involves Sherlock um, because it's absolutely obvious that this is the case. Um, this is foreign money uh, coming into, quite a lot of Chinese money coming into to, um, London and totally decoupling house prices and property prices from salaries. Uh, so here is uh, UBS's little uh, infographic showing uh, the most expensive places in the world to own property, London being at the top, Hong Kong, Sydney, Vancouver. Uh, but it is, to coin a phrase which I don't like to use, it is unsustainable um, and it's going to end in tears in the not too distant future. Uh, very big tears, particularly for those people who haven't taken any preparations for when this financial collapse happens. Mm. It's always fascinating to see that when we don't plan things, the pieces of the jigsaw come together. Uh, so just watching comments in uh, the UK column chat box, somebody has said, well, don't forget, of course, that Cornwall uh, was a pioneer of the European Union interreg status. This is uh, where the European Union was pushing, of course, for the promotion of minority uh, communities within all of the European countries. It was giving them support. It was essentially encouraging them to go for independence. And uh, what have we now seen? The calls for Scott for uh, Cornish devolution. Uh, we've seen local district councils in Cornwall uh, simply disposed of in order to create one super state, the Cornwall County Council, Cornwall Council. Uh, run at one stage by a gentleman who didn't even live in Cornwall. Uh, but other things are at work in Cornwall. And as some people have said to us, it's pretty dark. Well, this is uh, not only happening in Cornwall, it's happening in other places. But a man is bundled out of a council meeting by security guards. There's the famous security guards, um, simply because he asked a question. Uh, now, the mayor has had to um, apologise, Mr. Nebersnick, if I've pronounced that pr uh, properly, uh, because it emerged, of course, that this gentleman came, uh, the member of the public came into the meeting slightly late and therefore hadn't heard the statement that uh, basically they'd closed the sections for questions. Uh, but the other bit that goes with this, of course, is that uh, many councils are now closing down questions by, from the public by saying, well, you can only have a question answered if you've actually put it in writing before the meeting. Uh, this was the, the sort of classic Soviet tactic that everything in a meeting is decided beforehand. You need the questions to come in beforehand so that you can orchestrate the answers that are then given publicly. Um, but this is the state of politics in Cornwall, which many people I don't mean to be rude here. Many people, certainly in London, would regard this as a rather genteel um, social um, holiday area 
but we're bundling people out of meetings for um, asking the wrong question. I think we've got to say it again. We've got to contrast this with uh, Vladimir Putin's public meetings where he sits there and invites questions. And we've got this situation in this country where councils are completely unwilling to invite questions from members of the public. Yeah. It's incredible, isn't it? Because they're, they're frightened of what's going on. Well, as we see the close down uh, coming on a day by day basis, we're getting many people now emailing the column saying, look at the speed all the, this legislation is coming in. So it's not just the UK column team that see this happening. Obviously, many members of the public. Uh, but we wanted to just give you a reminder of what sort of ideology is coming in this country unless we, the public, start to take the right action to stop it. And what better place to start was the introduction of Satanism into the British Armed Forces around about 2004. And of course, we had Tony Blair as Prime Minister. This was part of the Telegraph's report that uh, Satanism was considered the right form of religion to bring into the Royal Navy. And uh, we just identified that at that time, Jeff Hoon was the Secretary of State for Defence. So is Mr. Hoon a Satanist or does he believe that Satanism is a good thing? Presumably he did and still does. The first Sea Lord, Admiral Alan West, well, when he's um, not having a bop and playing pirates with the Abba girls, um, it seems that he was delighted to bring Satanism into the accepted onboard religions. Uh, or, of course, we could have had Air Chief Marshal Jock Stirrup involved or indeed General Sir Mike Jackson. I think many people would be surprised at him, but who knows? We're asking the question um, if uh, Tony Blair was happy to promote Satanism is there any other policy that probably wouldn't promote torture, for instance? Oh, no, he's already done that, Mike, hasn't he? So there we are. If anybody can help us with names of people in the senior jobs in the civil service who helped to bring Satanism into Britain's uh, Royal Navy, please tell us. We're also interested to know which uh, politicians were involved in this um, particularly bad decision. Uh, but it does give a reflection on what we can expect in the future if we allow this dictatorship to properly install itself. Have you got any good news, Mike? It's raining. It's raining. That's the good news. So um, global cooling is on hold at the moment. We're into some cool, wet weather. Thanks very much for joining us. If you like what we do, please consider taking out a subscription or making a donation. Uh, we can only do what we do with your help. We would like to expand our uh, video and studio capability so that we can't reach out and touch the walls. Uh, this would allow us to bring in, for example, panel discussions, but we can only do that by moving to new locations. So if you like what we do, please consider a donation or a subscription. Thanks very much for joining us. We'll be back same time tomorrow. Bye-bye.